Welcome to everybody to the ISNAF Young Investigation Marlio Gerlar Award Symposium. My name is Leila De Floriani. I am professor of the University of Maryland in College Park and a member of the ISNAF Scientific Council. A few words about ISNAF. As you all know, ISNAF, which stays for Italian Scientists Scholars in North American Foundation, was founded in 2007 and is a non-profit organization that has the mission to connect, empower, celebrate Italian scientists in North America. Right now, it connects more than 3,000 scholars, researchers, and technology, and propose the networks among the such community, and also with private and public organization in North America and in Italy. ISNAF grants the, every year the Young Investigator Awards in various disciplines. There are six awards, and to outstanding early career Italian researcher and scholar that work in the United States or in Canada. And these awards want to recognize their significant and innovative contribution to the field of research. In this symposium, we are consider we are uh, granting the Mario General, uh, Gerla, Gerla Award for Research in Computer Science, which was established by the Gerla family in 2019. And this is award is in memory of Professor Mario Gerla, who is a pioneer in computer networks and professor of computer science at UCLA and in, in one of the ISNA founding members. Thanks for, for the, to the um, fa Gerla family to uh, put together to this award sponsoring it. And I would like first to introduce uh, my other colleagues on the, on the jury for this award. Uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Elisa Bertino, who is the Samuel Conte Professor of Computer Science for Jew University and is a member of the ISNAF board. Professor Philip Mentzer, who is the Ladis Distinguished Professor of Informatics and Computer Science at Indiana University and a member of the ISNA Scientific Council. We have a presentation here for three finalists who will present in alphabetic order. And this uh, their presentation will be followed by a question and answer question with questions that we'll have from the jury and from the, by the audience. And uh, I please, uh, for the audience, please enter your question in the room, in the Zoom chat. So without further ado, Let's start with the first finalist in alphabetic order, that is Dr. Leonardo Bonatti. He's a social researcher in Northeastern University. And this presentation will be on next generation wireless networks with open and intelligent automated systems. Leonardo, please, you have the floor. So, hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, I'm Leonardo Bonatti. I'm a researcher at Northeastern University, and I will talk to you about my research that entails next generation wireless networks with open and intelligent automated systems. So the last few years have seen an evolution on cellular networks that disrupted the traditional monolithic architecture, where we had a single black box that took care of all the functionalities of the network and took all these functionalities and disaggregated them across different elements of the network, as you can see in the right here. So we have these functionalities that can now be distributed across the network and can be taken care of in uh, software. We also have some intelligence controllers here uh, acting at different time scales that are one of the contributions from Oran. So with all of this, we can uh, control the network functionalities in software and deploy some intelligent applications on the controllers so that we can optimize the network based on the uh, actual uh, real-time behavior of the network. So my contributions uh, to research are to uh, expand this vision of open run with capabilities that span from enhanced uh, network performance uh, to improve the performance of the network, to sharing of uh, resources available in the network, and to improve resilience, reliability, and security. So I'm doing that uh, through intelligence and adaptive network control and end-to-end -end intelligent orchestration through neutral loss infrastructure and spectrum sharing and energy aware deployment and scaling and automated deployment and testing with intent-based network instantiation. 
This is done first in analysis and design, and then approaches are implemented and demonstrated on experimental platforms uh, publicly available to the research community, such as Colosseum, X5G, or the city scale platforms of the Power Program. So uh, the first line of research I have is intelligent network control uh, through ORAN. So uh, in this uh, domain, uh, I contributed to uh, the development and open sources of our framework that is Open Run Gym, that uh, is available for experimenters to perform network control and optimization. So Open Run Gym is an open source framework for XApp development. XApps are the intelligent applications that I was mentioning before. And uh, we can also perform uh, data collection at scale and experimentation to validate the uh, developer approaches. So with uh, this framework overall, we can collect different data sets uh, from open run at scale on virtual emulated and wireless scenarios. Then we can design and train uh, our solutions and package uh, these machine learning solutions in the form of applications that are compliant with the ORAN specifications and can be run on a network. And then finally, we can test and refine uh, the developed applications first in controlled environments and then uh, in actual uh, production platforms. An example are machine learning applications that can be designed on the Colosseum Open Run Digital Twin, such as applications for the joint optimization on, of run slicing and scattering. And this is an example of an application that achieves up to 20% gain with respect to baseline solutions. And then applications developed in this way can be transitioned to different platforms, like the platforms uh, from the Power uh, Platform, as you can see in the bottom right. And even if platforms are very different and use very different hardware, we can see that uh, the behavior uh, of the solutions that we design is very consistent across the different platforms. Another uh, topic that I would like to talk about is the neutral host uh, infrastructure and uh, sharing of spectrum. So uh, after doing control on open run, uh, I started looking into how uh, we can optimize the use of resources and share uh, the resources among different tenants of the network. So for example, uh, the operators. And uh, in this context, uh, let's say the operators uh, don't really own the infrastructure themselves, but we have a neutral loss provider that owns the infrastructure and can rent uh, the available resources to the tenants. So we have the tenants, so the operators that can submit some requests to uh, an SMO through a framework that uh, I contributed to develop. And then the resources are optimally uh, allocated based, the requests are optimally allocated based on the available resources, uh, which can be, for example, compute nodes, memory, CPU, but also a spectrum available that the operators are requesting. After the resources are uh, admitted, uh, we can instantiate them through uh, this framework. So we can instantiate the various elements of the network. For example, we can instantiate a 5G genome B, a core network, some uh, RIC, or intelligent applications. And uh, this was uh, developed uh, on top of a Red Hat OpenShift uh, based infrastructure. And finally, once the resources are instantiated, the various tenants can uh, share uh, the workloads. So for example, different tenants can share the same compute, or they can be allocated on the same G B, uh, sharing the available uh, spectrum that is allocated to them. This was formulated mathematically, uh, where we have uh, constraints that span from the uh, number of resources that can be emitted to uh, the frequency to the uh, coverage area of the various cells. And then was experimentally evaluated uh, in a testbed that uh, we have uh, in our laboratory. So this testbed is based on, on OpenShift, as I was mentioning, and it controls software and radios that connect to antennas deployed on the ceiling of a, a large office space. So we took uh, this layout and we mapped that uh, through different uh, cells allocated to different operators. And we observed uh, a couple of uh, things. So the first thing is that we're able to uh, instantiate a full uh, open run network in around 10 seconds, where uh, we had uh, only a generic purpose software uh, and a generic purpose hardware infrastructure. Um, the second thing is that uh, we have that sharing resources improves performance and uh, spectrum utilizations uh, among the different tenants. Then we also look into the uh, energy aware intelligence scaling uh, with Oran, because uh, with Oran we can uh, deploy different applications. But uh, the more applications we deploy, um, 
the less likely is that uh, we are able to satisfy this, the strict uh, latency requirements of Laurent um, and of the rate control. So one approach could be to distribute the apps. Uh, however, this is not always feasible because uh, we have that we still need to satisfy some inference and timing, be mindful of uh, congestion that causes some delays. So we first uh, model um, this behavior of the applications uh, with real data from our testbed, and then uh, we develop a framework to upscale and, uh, and downscale the compute nodes of our infrastructure based on the resources and the uh, requirements of the intelligent applications. And we have that our approach, which is called uh, Scalorum here, uh, is able to allocate the XAPs on the Red Hat OpenShift infrastructure and is able to comply with the deadlines while the plain OpenShift allocator cannot do that. Uh, and we are up to 10 times faster than uh, the default allocator of OpenShift. Uh, another uh, topic that I would like to mention is the uh, automated deployment and testing of Open Run software. Uh, so I was mentioning that with Open Run, uh, we have open source software and approaches, and these software and approaches will have a major role uh, in future uh, generations of networks. So because of this, it's very uh, important to be able to test uh, the software to find out uh, inefficiency, performance degradations, bugs, anomalies, or security vulnerabilities before the software is actually deployed and used on a production infrastructure. However, this is not trivial. As of today, uh, most of these operations are done manually and they're very time consuming. So for example, imagine you need to test some software like this, you need to deploy um, a full infrastructure with base station users, and then uh, run intelligent controllers and intelligent uh, machine learning applications, such as XAPs or, or RAPs. And the, this is so uh, involved that probably by the time you're done testing some release, a new release uh, of the open source software that you're testing already came out, so your release is basically obsolete. So this is why we need uh, for some way to automate the testing uh, procedures. So for example, uh, one of the things that I did is to develop some uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and continuous testing pipeline to uh, test and experiment on in an end-to-end -end manner, such as the network uh, components are not tested individually. So I'm not testing, for example, uh, the functionalities of a base station as a standalone component, but I'm testing the functionalities as part of a larger network with uh, multiple components. So uh, an example would be that a new functionality uh, is being developed and a new functionality is under testing. Uh, this functionality can be packaged as a code patch on top of the uh, baseline uh, source code. For example, if we consider a base station source code, and then uh, we have an automated system that I develop that doesn't require any human interaction and can autonomously uh, gather the latest version of the code, for example, from a remote uh, Git repository, and then can uh, apply the patch. And in this example, I'm showing for uh, a 5G GNB from Open Interface. And then it can build the code with the applied patch and form some containers, for, such, such as Docker or LXC, that can be deployed on an infrastructure and tested. So the next step is to deploy the containers and perform some automated testing over the air, where the developed container in this example is uh, the 5G GNB can, that can be instantiated on the infrastructure that I was mentioning. And then uh, the base station can be tested providing connectivity to some uh, commercial modems that include several wireless modems, such as the one uh, in the picture uh, here. The same can be done on different infrastructures. So for example, on the Colosseum uh, digital twin using some other uh, tools, but similar in concept. And then uh, the software can be deployed and tested on a larger infrastructure with different uh, emulated wireless environments, mobility of the users and so on and so forth. Uh, results can be collected on, after testing and they can be assembled in a history of results as time goes on. And then I can use this history to compare with my most recent test to understand if the test pass or fail, uh, in which case it can generate some logs to uh, send to the uh, developers of the code under test. So this is a pipeline that I recently contributed to uh, open air interface that uh, are developing 5G protocol stacks for GNOTBs and users. And uh, they can use this pipeline on Colosseum to uh, run tests on their uh, versions of open air interface before they risk them to the community and understand if their software uh, has some issue or if it works uh, as expected. 
Um, and the test would generate an automated report, like the one you see here on the right, telling you different statistics of the test and uh, different performance that uh, the developers are interested in uh, finding out. The same has been uh, developed on an over, over the infrastructure on top of the Red Hat OpenShift framework. And then uh, the pipeline has been running for more than 15 months, and this time automatically, testing different over the air configurations of testing and servers. And basically, we can see that uh, in the results collected in these 15 months, we can see uh, at a glance where there might be software degradations or different configurations that uh, need uh, to be looked uh, into. So to uh, conclude my presentation, uh, I contributed and uh, developed and open source some tools for intelligent intent-driven open run control on Colosseum and also on other platforms like the platforms for the uh, power program. And the open wrenching website, which collects uh, some tutorials on how to use some tool these tools and the open source software released as uh, more than uh, 1,500 monthly visitors on average demonstrated some benefits for natural lost resource uh, and spectrum sharing, showing that sharing the infrastructure is beneficial and we can achieve performance as good, if not uh, better than when the infrastructure is not shared, but uh, using fewer uh, resources. And then I contributed to open source projects such as Open Interface and pipelines for automation of testing on an open run infrastructure have uh, different patent applications plus additional disclosure and the IP resulting from my work is being commercialized by a spin-off of the uh, Northeastern Wireless uh, Internet of Things Institute. And I would like to thank my colleagues and th I would like to thank you also for the attention and this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for the very insightful presentation. I don't see any question on the chat. Let me open to question to the jury. Yeah, perhaps I can start. Leonardo, thanks for the presentation. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the spin-off that uh, you know, will uh, use some of the technology? Will you be involved in the spin-off or what the spin-off will do exactly? So the, uh, thank you for for the question. So the the, the spin-off is a, a spin-off that started um, a couple of years ago, I would say, and it's still at very early stages. Uh, the spin-off is taking uh, some IP that uh, was developed uh, through this work and through other work, and is trying to develop uh, automated deployment infrastructure so that uh, basically. Uh, users can stand up deployments with just a click of a button from a dashboard instead of going through all these steps that are uh, involved in standing up an infrastructure like this. They can just use a dashboard uh, and they can deploy simply with a click of a button an infrastructure in about 10 seconds. And the infrastructure would uh, entail base stations, users, uh, run intelligent controller and intelligent applications. And this infrastructure as of now runs on top of uh, Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform, which has a enhanced version of Kubernetes with additional uh, security uh, configurations. And uh, I'm not directly involved as of now, but uh, I hope to be uh, more involved in the future. Thank you. Other question? Maybe I'll go with the questions. Can you tell in general on your research the the role of learning of, of AI that in 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 all your work? Yeah. So thank you, thank you for the question. So, um, so my work initially started with traditional optimization. It wasn't um, we didn't start with AI, but uh, with traditional optimization, we saw that uh, we we could do a good job in optimizing the performance of the network, but uh, some of the uh, objective functions uh, were not uh, really always uh, in close form, so we couldn't uh, really do uh, the best uh, that, that we could do. So we, we started looking into AI in the years, and we figured out that uh, with uh, training on AI in a good way uh, allows us to get a good performance of the network. So the way we uh, train the AI, however, uh, is very key to this point because the AI grid uh, would be uh, as good as uh, your training is, basically. So uh, one thing that I did is to uh, develop some uh, scenarios for the Colosseum platform. So the Colosseum platform is a, a network emulator, so it has software-defined radius, like the ones you would have in a regular uh, laboratory setup. 
but uh, the channels are not over the air, but they are emulated. Uh, and this means that you can capture and reproduce any channels, channel impulse response. So for example, I can model an outdoor deployment, an indoor deployment, and so on and so forth via tools such as wireless insight, so commercial retracers. And then I can use the same scenario in Colosseum to train my, uh, to first collect data actually uh, at scale with different configurations so that uh, I collect enough data for my model to generalize to different uh, deployment on the production infrastructure. And then uh, I can train uh, my application on this data, verify the application works on the control environment offered by Colosseum, which is a good representation of a wireless system, but at the end of the day, it's still an emulated environment. And then I can take the same solutions and play them in actual uh, deployments in this case. So for example, the testbed in the lab that I was mentioning, that has software defined radios and commercial users, or the platforms from the power program, which are uh, city scale platforms that span uh, different uh, miles uh, of coverage with software defined radios and uh, commercial users or software defined radio users. So through this loop, I can first design a controlled environment, collecting data and training, and then I can transition my solutions, proving that uh, the solutions that I initially designed in my controlled environment are applicable and they have a consistent behavior when deployed in the real world platform. Thank you, then, Abdul. Other do question? We have, do we have time for one more? Oh, I think, I think so. Okay. Leonardo, thank you for the presentation. Uh, could you say a little bit about robustness of the networks that you build? Uh, obviously, they are getting more and more complicated, <clears throat> where one piece depends on other pieces, whether they are part of the intelligent infrastructure or they're part of the communication infrastructure because they need to talk to each other in order to do optimization. Uh, so I, I see I see a system where the communication relies on energy and energy relies on computing power and computing power relies itself on the communication. So does that does that include in um adds fragility in some sense. Like let's say if there is an attack or, or a national disaster and one piece of that infrastructure goes down, does the rest also become more vulnerable? Or, or, or in fact, in, in, on the other hand, are you designing uh, ways for these systems to be robust in these situations? Can, can you say something about that? Yeah, so thanks for the, for the question. So of course, if uh, in the case there's a disaster, the net, some pieces of the network might go down. But uh, one thing that I worked on uh, is an orchestration, orchestration system that uh, figures out the, the network or portions of the network go down, and then they uh, replicate the part that went down on the uh, remaining infrastructure. So let's say I have a GNOME B that is deployed in the form of container on some infrastructure uh, nodes, so that the OpenShift nodes that I was mentioning, and this. Uh, container in a specific location gets hit by some uh, issue that can be, for example, I have an attack that can uh, bring down my container or I have a disaster that basically does the same. Uh, my infrastructure can react and see that the piece that was working before now doesn't work anymore and can instantiate a replica of that service on a healthy part of my infrastructure. So in this way, the network uh, can uh, reconfigure itself based not only on the actual uh, performance that I'm serving to my users. So for example, uh, if users change their demand, the network can reconfigure with AI to adapt to the new request and allocate more resources if needed, but also you can figure out if something uh, is not working properly on the infrastructure and can uh, act uh, some mechanism for self-healing and redeployment on the healthy part of the infrastructure to allow for a minimum uh, delay in service, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. And Thank uh, thanks again. And uh, we can go to the second uh, presentation. It is by Dr. Mario De Florio. He is a postdoctoral researcher at Brown University. And the title is Presentation Scientific Machine Learning for Dynamical System Identification. Please, uh, Mario. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending this presentation on scientific machine learning for dynamical system identification. Um, this talk will uh, introduce what has been my research in the past uh, five years between the University of Arizona 
Brown University and now continuing it at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So first of all, let's see uh, what the scientific machine learning is. Scientific machine learning is an emerging uh, discipline within the science, data science community. And uh, it draws um, uh, tools from both machine learning and scientific computing to develop new methods for scalable, uh, robust, reliable, and uh, interpretable learning and data analysis. And it will be cr critical in, the, in driving the next wave uh, of data-driven um, scientific discovery in both physical and engineering science. And uh, scientific machine learning is a multidisciplinary as it leverages expertise from uh, applied uh, and computational mathematics, physical sciences, and computer sciences. And what uh, I uh, I feel that is very fascinating about the scientific machine learning is its uh, applicability in, uh, in in the countless of uh, applied sciences such as uh, physics, biology, chemistry, energy system, uh, medical uh, sciences, and neuroscience. So the two key elements of scientific machine learning are observational and experimental data, which are acquired by directly observing a physical phenomena, and physics-based models, which are basically mathematical, mathemati mathematics first principles uh, that model certain uh, phenomena, and uh, these allow to, uh, science, scientists to, to directly uh, uh, use simulations to, to simulate these uh, uh, physical problems. Uh, the issues is that um, in the real world, uh, many times uh, physical phenomena are very difficult to observe and the data to be acquired, or um, or physics-based models can be inaccurate uh, since they are they are built uh, on mathematical assumptions. So uh, here is why uh, the concept of physics-informed neural network was born to use both of these ingredients data and physics models to um, to train uh, the neural network uh, conversely on how it was uh, always been done in classic neural networks that they are mostly data driven purely data driven frameworks so let's see with a small uh, little example how what is the difference between data driven and physics data driven trainings uh, imagine that we have the, um, uh, a spring mass systems where uh, we have a certain observation given by these uh, yellow dots. And uh, we can train a classic uh, feed forward neural network that can fit very well the observation data as long as we have this information. But uh, it can easily fail for, uh, uh, for future uh, time instance. Uh, so it can fail for forecasting a certain uh, devolution of certain system. So to, to avoid this uh, drawback, uh, what the physics informed neural network does is introducing a physics loss, which is the residual uh, of a differential equation, which, for, for example, for this case, uh, is fully known given by this uh, second order, uh, second order ordinary differential equation. And um, given to this uh, um, additive information, the neural network can uh, easily uh, predict uh, fitting the data, the observation data, and predict the future evolution of the, of the system. So what has been my research? Uh, it was developing and advancing uh, physics informed machine learning uh, algorithm by adding three particular features, which are theory of functional connection, random projection neural network, and domain decomposition, which we can talk more specifically in details uh, in the question sessions. Uh, but now let's see how we can divide the three different scenarios uh, depending on uh, on the availability of the data and the knowledge of the physics that we have. Um, for example, the first scenario is, is the case where we have uh, no data, um, but we have a fully knowledge of the physics, let's say a differential equation, and we want to use uh, our framework uh, uh, as a differential equation solver. I want to show you here uh, an example of a challenging uh, stiff chemical kinetics given by the modeling this uh, Bellus of Zabotinsky reaction, where uh, we can see uh, from our uh, framework named XTFC, uh, the blue line, we, can, uh, we are able to predict the evolution of these uh, uh, chemical agents in, in, for longer time integration compared to the state of the art uh, method uh, such as uh, Range Gupta algorithms. Uh, which they, in this case, for example, they fail after 50 seconds of, of, uh, of reaction. 
So here the questions uh, arise automatically. How much can we push this, for, this framework forward in time? And basically the answer would be relatively for infinite time. As we can see here, we, we can forecast the evolution given the initial condition of the agents up to 5,000 seconds of reaction for very uh, low computational uh, time, such as 400 seconds, while still being able to capture the steep change in the solution. Um, then we, uh, we push this framework for a real-world problem proposed by the Dutch National Institute of Public Health and Environmental Protection, which is an air pollution problem modeled by 25 reactions. And uh, even in this case, for, uh, let's say, one hour of uh, ongoing reaction, we are able to efficiently, accurately uh, to, to predict uh, the evolution in time of the concentration in very few seconds of computational time. The second uh, scenario is, uh, is the case in where we have uh, some of the data and some of the knowledge of the physics, and is the most common scenario, in, especially in uh, engineering applications. Uh, for example, for parameter estimation or uh, missing term uh, system identification. For the case of parameter estimation, um, we applied uh, our framework uh, in a collaboration between MIT, Brown University, and uh, NREL uh, for a solar, solar thermal energy plant, where our goal was to estimate the time-dependent uh, heat transfer coefficient gi given two different ingredients to train our neural network, which are the differential equation given by this uh, mass balance uh, equation and different real, uh, real data, uh, such as the uh, temperature of the tank, solar irradiance, uh, the temperature of the air, average wind speed, and the load profile of this uh, plant. And as we can see here for the third line of plot, we were able to accurately um, uh, estimate uh, this high frequency heat transfer coefficient uh, with the great accuracy in uh, with a relative error in the order of 10 up to minus 14 and 10, 10, up, to 10 up to minus 5. Uh, for computational time of 10 seconds, which is pretty low, considering that uh, um, we were studying one week of uh, operation of the plant, which allow us uh, to use this framework for uh, online uh, estimation without doing uh, a previous uh, uh, offline training. Uh, the second case in the second scenario is, uh, is uh, when uh, we have certain uh, missing term of the differential equation that we don't know, we are not sure, or maybe the system is misspecified. Mis and uh, to, to solve this kind of problems, we recently developed uh, this new framework, AI Aristotle for, for gray box identification applied to systems biology and pharmacokinetics. Basically here, the idea is uh, to, to use a physics informed neural network uh, to approximate the missing term approximate and estimate the missing term of the differential equations that we don't know, uh, which uh, we will feed the, the symbolic regression framework, which uses a um, uh, genetic algorithm to find and distill uh, the best uh, mathematical expression that fit uh, the data as input. And uh, once we discover this mathematical expression, basically we have uh, the full knowledge of the physics of the problem. So we performed physics discovery, uh, allowing for further uh, um, forecasting of certain systems. For example, let's consider this um, uh, systems biology model, which, is a, uh, which describes a glucose insulin interaction. And let's, let's imagine that we completely don't know these uh, terms uh, written in red. We can approximate them with the unknown functions, uh, time-dependent f and g. Uh, so we, what we want to do, as uh, previously said, we uh, we estimate their uh, the missing term uh, time uh, evolutions um, given only two observations, so partial observation of the system. In this case, are plasma, insulin, and glucose. And the symbolic regression, as we can see here, can perfectly fit uh, the data and uh, distill the mathematical expressions. Um, finally, the third case, the third scenario is, uh, is the kind of problem where we have the data, we can fully observe a certain dynamical system, 
but we don't have uh, we don't know any uh, kind of knowledge of uh, differential equation modeling this problem and this is a fully data driven approach we recently published this new framework ai lawrence in honor of uh, edward northrop lawrence the, fa the father of the chaos um uh, and I want to show you here a, a, a test example where we applied it to the very famous uh, Lorentz system for a very um, used for uh, studying of chaotic systems, uh, where we are able to effectively uh, discover the mathematical equations of the system, even for very noisy and uh, sparse observation data. As we can see here, uh, we can uh, outperform uh, state-of-the-art methods such as uh, CINDY, sparse uh, identification of nonlinear dynamic systems, uh, for longer time domain. So uh, these are just a few examples that I showed you, but uh, in the past five years, uh, to, to prove the robustness of our framework and its uh, generalization, we applied to, to a large number of different applications, such as um, rarefied gas dynamics, where we solved uh, the most classic uh, thermal creep, uh, poiseuille, uh, and quirk flows. Uh, radiative transfer problem, where we solved a problem uh, posed by the Radiation Commission of the International Association of Meteorology and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Science, that has uh, many applications in uh, atmospheric physics, air pollution, meteorology, and urban hydrology. Um, and again, we, we used it for neuroscience, for the neuro, neuron membrane activation using, using the Hodgkin Axley model, uh, perturb the orbit propagation for satellites in the cis lunar region, point kinetic equation for nuclear reactor dynamics, and uh, we recently started the total uncertainty quantification for certain cardiovascular model, and even um, applied to crowd dynamics uh, to simulate uh, emergency escape uh, scenario, uh, scenarios of pedestrians. Finally, um, I'm here now in Colorado the NREL uh, to, to use uh, this, this framework um, applied to, to the program ARIS, which is, uh, it stands for Advanced Research on Integrated Energy Systems, where our goal will be to create this uh, digital twin uh, platform uh, for um, electric grid uh, made of energy, hybrid energy systems uh, with uh, a number of connected devices and scale it up for a, probably a national grid uh, scenario with uh, millions uh, of connected devices. And for, um, I want to thank uh, for the participation and contribution to many of my friends and colleagues from uh, different institutions, both uh, academic and national laboratories, uh, for allowing this framework to be created. And uh, thank you so much uh, to the audience for attending this uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario, for the very interesting presentation. And uh, I am uh, opening uh, the floor to questions. Don't see any question in the chat. So I'll ask uh, Phil, Elisa, do you want to start or should I start? I'll, I'll, I'll ask one. I, I'm completely ignorant about uh, this, but uh, uh, so when in the case that you don't have a uh, you don't have you, you don't know the physics, let's say, like the last yeah. part of your presentation, how how do you where do you start? Like uh, what you have to make some assumptions or some. Yes, you have to, you example, have some kind of starting. Is is it based on some intuition of the problem or or it is it really, based on really anything? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it, it can be based on both assumption and intuition. For example, in this case, uh, when we have a chaotic system like, like the Lorentz systems, we know that um, uh, this is a time-dependent uh, evolution of the problem. So in this case, we want to find, uh, um, we have, uh, mm, if we look at this uh, animation, we have these uh, um, gray dots as uh, only ingre ingredients that we have to train our neural network. Uh, which um, we used to do regression. So we we uh, we do an evaluation of the trajectory uh, of this uh, system, and we can use the since the neural network is a it's an analytical approximation, it's an analytical expression. We can compute an analytical derivative of this mm -hmm. system in time. So we use uh, to feed the symbolic regression. We will use both the trajectory and their derivative in time. 
And this symbolic regression will find uh, all the linear and nonlinear com possible combination between uh, all these agents that best fit uh, the observation that you have. So at the end, you will find, uh, for example, for this system, you will find uh, we have three independent variables, x, y, and z. So we will find the derivative, the derivative in time, are equal to something, which is uh, what the symbolic regression finds. So we have this differential equation in, in, in time. Of course, if you have a certain knowledge of the system, for example, if you know that this, uh, the behavior is uh, has a certain sinusoidal behavior, uh, you can add this information to the symbolic regression to use uh, this operator, like sine or cosine, to, uh, to narrow the, uh, the space of research of Thank these you. mathematical expressions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I have a very quick question. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are these very, you know, what I call the large language models that seems to know mm -hmm. a lot. So do you think that in the future, somebody can develop the equivalent for specific area of physics? Well, uh, that's a good question, actually. I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, LLMs, but uh, some of my colleagues at Brown University are. And uh, what they're done, actually, is, uh, is they just developed a new framework and they started a new startup named Phoenix, where they use uh, uh, langu uh, large language models to, to help the scientists to develop the physics-informed machine learning algorithms. So basically, it's like a chat GPT for, uh, for scientific machine learning experts, uh, where uh, it can help to understand the problem, uh, how to, what kind of uh, framework, well, what's the best framework that you can use, and how's the best way that you can, uh, um, that the best approach and strategy you can uh, take uh, to solve these kind of problems. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert in uh, langu large language models. Maybe one day I will uh, start to work on it. But that's a very interesting topic, Emily, especially for scientific machine learning. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Mario, I actually have a question. You presented three different uh, scenarios and yes. uh, you have developed tools for all of them. Where do you think uh, now in the future there will be of this approach? It will be where uh, I have a lot of physics uh, or on the other side uh, of the arrow, the more promising, uh, you can get more promising results. I, I believe that here we should have the fourth scenarios when we have no physics and we have a partial availability of the data, uh, which uh, is actually part of um, what I want to do for my future research, trying to, uh, to fill and compensate also these drawbacks. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that today we should focus uh, mostly on this scenario because uh, our technology uh, to acquire data are always more and more advanced. So, um, uh, yes, I, I believe uh, these, uh, these two, number two and three, mostly number three for system identification is where we want to focus. Well, wonderful. And uh, I mean, you have been showing uh, also in the first scenario uh, that uh, improvement of other, through, uh, over other traditional uh, methods. Uh, do, you, do you have a general sense when, uh, I'm interested in the first one for some reason, but yeah. <laughs> and it, where uh, this approach, uh, machine learning based approach will work better in general? Well, um, I'm, I advanced the physics in for machine learning, particularly for uh, dynamical systems with time series data. Uh, and using, um, uh, using uh, uh, random projection neural network, which is a very fast optimization algorithm for neural network, uh, and uh, uh, also taking advantage of, the advantage of domain decomposition, I found, this, uh, I found this kind of application being the best one for this kind of framework. Of course, depending on what we want to tackle, we need to use different frameworks. I don't believe it exists a perfect method for all the kind of problems. For example, if we want to solve a partial differential equation, maybe we want to move more on deep learning because the structure of this new, of a deep learning neural network has a higher expressivity, which can help 
to to capture certain uh, features on the solution that can be sharp uh, gradients, sharp solution. Um, um, and uh, yes, I, I believe uh, it depends. We have, we have to use the weapon depending on the, the problem that we want to solve. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? If none, I think I'll go to the next presentation. Thank you, Mario, again. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. And the next presentation is from Dr. Federico Rossi from Robot Robotics Technologies at the NASA Jet Proportion Lab and California Institute of Technology. And uh, Federico will talk about making teams of autonomous robots work effectively together in space. Please, Federico. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Yep. And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, can you see yeah. me? Not yet. There we go. All righty. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks to the previous presenters. These were great presentations. And I love that all three presentations were in different ways of distributed systems. That works my heart. I'm Federico. I'm a roboticist at JPL. And my work is on distributed systems with wheels or in orbit that work for exploration. So why do we do this? Why does JPL, why is NASA interested in this? Systems because there are so many high priority questions that we can only answer by getting multiple measurements of the same phenomenon from multiple places. If we want to understand weather and climate on Mars, which we need to understand not only for basic science but also to get humans there one day, we need networks of weather stations. If we want to study the interiors of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. We could go there in real, it's really expensive and really hard, or we can study those from orbit or from the surface with magnetometry and seismology. But to do that, we need multiple sensors to see how the magnetic field evolves in space and over time, to see how um, se seismic disturbances propagate across the core. Uh, my favorite one, we've detected uh, methane on Mars. We've had somewhat reliable detections of methane on Mars from Curiosity. Methane is a biomarker on Earth. You feel methane, you think cows. On Mars, there could be uh, a uh, non-living phenomena that cause methane, or there could be bacteria, but we don't even know where it's coming from. Distributed instruments are, if not the only way, the best way to address these questions. So this justifies why we need sensor network, but why do we need autonomy? Why do I get a job at JPL? Largely two reasons. The first one is latency. The solar system is big. If you want to control a space for the Saturn, the lifetime round trip, even if you had an antenna trained on it the whole time, is an hour and a half. You go out to Neptune, it's three, four hours. So if you want to catch transient phenomena, you need to have onboard intelligence in these sensor networks for them to react weaker than human. And the second reason is really scalability. Uh, I love this picture. Um, before we send a spacecraft somewhere, uh, we do an ORT, an operational readiness test, where we simulate a day in the life, we get all the operators and the scientists in a room, and we role play a day in the life. This was a day in the life of Perseverance, the latest rover we sent to Mars, and JPL had to commandeer the biggest meeting room we had. Now imagine sending just three or five sensors we don't have a room big enough to fit all these operators. You need autonomy because otherwise operations don't scale. So what are hard things about having multi-agent systems in space that keep me up at night, that keep me interested? Extreme environmental uncertainty. We don't know what's there. If we knew what's there, we wouldn't be going. Communication is infrequent and imperfect. Radios are not perfect. We don't have a server rack. We have radio networks that communicate in environments that we don't know. What does regolith do to your Wi-Fi? We don't know, we're gonna find out in a year. Safety verification and validation. Uh, you don't run any software when there's $5 billion national asset. You want to be extra sure that you won't break your order. And operations, because if you have software on board scientific system that is deciding I'm going to take this observation, not that one, at some point you're gonna have an upset scientist. You'd better be able to explain to them, this is why we didn't take the observation you care about. And broadly, these are the areas I'm interested in. 
for environmental uncertainty, I've been working in collaboration with Dylan Shell at Texas A&M on sequential decision making, OMDTs, if you know what they are, and their interesting forms of uncertainty that are relevant to space life, like a human checks in once a day, other than that, than that you're on your own. At hour 23, do you take action autonomously or do you use aid for the human? For imperfect communication, we've been working on planning and scheduling algorithms that are aware of this uh, communication environment, that are aware that communication links will come and go at prescribed times, but they may also not show up. There may be a stochastic component and adapt to that. For safety verification and validation, we're working with CU Boulder on planning algorithms, again, for partially observable market decision processes that allow an operator to specify a formal uh, LTL, linear temporal logic um, uh, formula, and get a controller that is guaranteed with high probability to satisfy this formula. And for operations, we've been working with operators at JPL and with designers to build tools and workflows that allow us to understand what data do we need to get back, to explain what the autonomy is doing. How can we do that in a team type? Because often we use autonomy to reduce the amount of data we send back. And how to ultimately keep our operators and our scientists happy. Now, I could spend an hour on each of these, but I want to do something a little different. I want to tell you about a more applied project that I've been working on for the last three years and try to draw a line between how research gets infused into flight using that project as an example. The project is CADRE, Cooperative Autonomous Distributed Robotic Explorers. CADRE is three rovers and a base station flying to the moon about a year from now. We're currently slated to fly December 2025. I can say that now. We have three rovers. We're going to land near the equator on the moon in the Rainer Gamma region. From the ground, we're going to tell the rovers, we'd like for you to get us the data to build a map of this 20 by 20 meter area. You have cameras. You have drone penetrating radar on board. Figure it out. Send us a postcard when you're done. And from that point on, the system is on its own. It has to decide when the rovers wake up when they go to sleep so that they can recharge and cool down. It has to decide who goes where. If somebody's in charge of the team, the autonomy has to decide who's in charge, depending on, for example, who go to sleep last. It's a great application of autonomy. And I've had the privilege to lead the multi-agent autonomy team for CADRE for the last three years, which means I put together the, the, the folks working on multi-agent autonomy that have been leading them for the last three years designing the algorithm, implementing them into flight software, and supporting testing. Now, why don't we do, why do we go to the moon? We said, you know, the solar system is big, the moon is close. And to explain that, I want to talk about technology readiness level, or TRL. Now, TRL is another definition of how ready a technology is for flight, and there is a 2,000-page book on it if you're interested, but I love this definition by astrophysicist Grant Tremblay. It's a number between one and nine. TRL one is, what if there were unicorns? You have an idea. TRL3 is Unicorn V8 Final Final dot CAD. I think of this as we wrote a conference paper on an idea. TRL4 is we got a horse, we placed a horn on it. And that's like the journal paper version. You have an idea, you verified it, you wrote it down, you did some tests. That's great. You can't use a technology, you can't propose a technology for flight until it gets TRL6. We took the horse outside, it worked as a system, and now we're calling it a unicorn. For something to fly on a flagship, you want it to be closer to TRL-8. You've tested it, and it works. And the point of CADRE is to take technologies for distributed systems that are at TRL-4 and get them to 7, where they are now, 8, if we pull it off on the moon next year, so that they can be used for future missions. So I only have like 6 or 7 minutes left. I've lost count. So I typically give this talk saying, well, there are six questions that we want to address about Cadre's autonomy architecture. How do we coordinate? Who's the leader, if there is a leader? Where do we make decisions? If there is a hierarchical architecture, what decisions do we centralize and which ones do we decentralize? And then, you know, the decisions that we're making, when do we drive, when do we sleep? How do we explore together? How do we drive together? I'm only going to have time for the left-hand side. How do we coordinate? Who's the leader? Where are decisions made? We can come back to the right-hand side in the Q&A, or as you can tell, I'm always happy to talk about this. Just send me an email. So how do we coordinate and who's the leader? We spent a lot of time thinking about this. And broadly, there are like five ways of coordinating a multi-agent system. The first one is you paint the number on one of the agents and you decide that's the leader. 
It's basically a centralized system with wonky communication. And that works really well. It's the simplest way of doing things. You should always do that if you have reliable communication. So why don't we do that on Cadre? Well, sometimes, you know, your leader ends up in St. Helena, stranded, unable to communicate, and then your system is dead. We don't like that. We want to be able to resist to agents going down. So the next thing you can do is you elect a leader. It has all the advantages of uh, having a monarch, except if your leader goes incommunicado, moves to Tunisia or something like that, you elect a new one and you're good to go. But you need to come up with an election protocol that is robust, because if you end up with two leaders or zero leaders, you're again dead in the water. You can have implicit coordination. Everybody talks to everybody else. Everybody comes up with a common picture of the world. Every agent solves the problem of what would be the right thing to do for everybody and then does its own part. That works really well uh, when the agents are coordinated. But if agents have different views of the war, you can have weird divergences where two agents do the same task or no agents do a task and you don't understand why. You can have auction algorithms where agents bid on tasks. Hey, I've seen a rock there. Who wants to go and check it out? This works extremely well if you have a centralized place that runs the auction. But at that point, aren't you creating a leader and then doing extra things? Or you can have swarm-based approaches in which every agent looks at two, three neighbors and then uses some simple heuristics to decide where to go next. And of course, the trick is that designing the simple heuristic is not simple at all. We spent a lot of time at JTL thinking about this and reasoning about, you know, what's the right approach for what we're doing? So we rated these approaches on bandwidth. How much communication do we need? Resilience. If a node goes down, do we survive to that or not? Consistency. How likely is it that the agents will make the right decisions? Scalability. Can I use this with a thousand agents? How about then? Uh, expressivity. How easy is it to encode a really complicated formula? Like do this unless your temperature is lower than this threshold and then do this other thing. Those are really hard things to do with swarms. How interpretable it is. Once I get the result, does it make sense or no? And I'm not here to tell you, you should always use an elected leader architecture. I'm here to tell you that on Hadrid, we decided to have an elected leader architecture because it made sense. We were really worried about resilience. We were quite worried about consistency. We don't want to have to explain to Congress why robots diverged and you know did something weird. We had a pretty complex mission statement, so we wanted to be very expressive. And we were medium worried about scalability, but we're four agents. So you know it doesn't have to work with a thousand agents. Now I'm giving, you know, I, I try to give these talks at a very high level, keep the audience engaged and whatnot, but each of these is a mathematical formal interpretation. Bandwidth is n log n. If you're doing um, old wall shared word, you go to n squared very quickly. Uh, resilience, we don't have a single point of failure because we are able to read our election to quickly recover from failure and you can quantify the time it takes to recover. I could then go into each of these, but this is how we talk to what our architecture should be. And we went with an elected leader architecture. If you're interested, we are using the Gallagher, Tumblr, and Sierra GHS algorithm to build a minimum spending tree in a distributed manner. We don't actually care about the minimum spending tree. We care about the fact that it is a root, and everybody agrees on who the root is. Uh, is there a question? Maybe not. Sorry, I'm very happy to take questions as I go. Um, we use GHS to select a root. Once we have a root, we use that root as the pointer to decide who the next who the leader should be and who the designated survivor should be. And we do that every 10 seconds. So we're using a classic algorithm straight out of Nancy Lynch's book. Some adaptation to make sure it runs continuously, not as a one-shot approach. And we put in the telemetry to make sure we understand what this is doing when we are on it. Where are the decisions made? Once we have a leader, once we've elected a leader, what we do is we try to push as many decisions as possible down to individual agents. <laughs> Sorry, I may have mentioned this. I'm in an airport right now. We just came back from Kennedy Space Center. Where are the decisions made? Well, we have ground. And ground tells us things like, this is the region to explore. This is the path you should follow with your ground penetrating radar. Then on the leader, we have a strategic planner. Oops. 
that besides for old agents, this is when you all should wake up. You're allowed to go to sleep now. We don't need you. Uh, let's all go to sleep and reconvene at this time. Also, on the leader, we decide when to explore the region, which region is assigned to every agent, and for driving, which tube the agents should be in. We don't give the agents a trajectory to follow. We give them a tube. So long as they stay inside the tube, life is good. And this is the abbreviated version of the talk, but this is kind of what the regions look like. And if you want to see the tubes, can, each of these color. I cannot see the slide. You cannot see the slide? No. Have I been talking with no slide? We, we, can, we, can, we can, we can, we can, we can. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well, let's try I this again. I could see them. I could see them. So. Okay. No, but they want everybody to see them. How about wow. now? Yes. Better? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Okay, I and also have to tell it. you that you should wrap up a bit. Yeah, yeah, okay, I have a couple more slides. I'm sorry, I, oh yeah, we're over time. All right, on the leader, we just we give regions and formations. Individual agents explore the regions and stay inside the corridor. So, so long as things are good and we have no failures, we don't need to talk to the leader a lot. There is a GNC stack, we don't talk about that, it actually drives, and leader election makes sure that we have a leader all the time. How do we test this? Um, in many ways, we have a few million unit tests. We test in software, we test in simulation, we test on three different hardware platforms. What does this look like? These are low fidelity hardware platform driving around 20X in the Mars yard. These are two rovers driving together, simulating use of a ground plane radar. radar. And you see these rovers are bigger. They are as big as the, the ones we're gonna fly, but they have 3D printed wheels. In the video that we're very proud of are the three actual flight rovers driving in the clean room just before we put them in the fridge to prepare them for flight. I'm going very quickly. So what's the point of this? We are working to increase the technology readiness of Cather. We are working to show that distributed algorithms can be used not only in the server rack, where they are by uh, hyperscalers and cloud integrators the whole time, but also in robotics. And we want to show that they can be used in the field on the moon and ideally in the rest of the solar system. If we pull this off, if we show that multi unit autonomy can work, we can imagine having uh, winter stations on Mars that talk to each other, networks of balloons on Venus that sense earthquakes, um, swarms of spacecraft observing small bodies, each with its own instrument. Um, and even for Earth science, there is some really interesting work that I wish I had more time to talk about, about studying Antarctic glaciers from below with swarms of vehicles. Now, one last slide as I go to the Q&A. I talked about Cadre and, you know, we have these beautiful renderings, three spacecraft on the moon. It's going to be amazing. This is Cadre. It's coming in 14 months on the moon. But more importantly, this is Cadre. This is half the planning of the multi-agent autonomy team that I led in the clean room with the vehicles. This is Cadre. This is the entire team of people working on software, hardware, safety, verification, and validation. None of this happens without them. Research is a team effort. And I'm going to go to a video that shows what Cadre does, and we can go to the Q&A, or I can stop sharing. Sorry, I went slightly long. Do you want me to keep up the video or stop sharing? I don't I, I think it's okay to to keep it up while we while we ask while we are asking yeah, yeah questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't see questions from the chat, and let me go to Phil or uh, Elisa, or I can ask a question. Thanks a lot for the very interesting presentation. By the way, while reading your application, I was very curious to know, learn more about this CAD system. Very very curious. Thanks. Thank you for the interest. It's uh, it's an it's very exciting. I'll if I may ask a question. I, I think you kind of made a made a, a uh, made a clear point that the decision about which coordination approach to take depends on lots of different factors, and there are different choices, and that leads to different trade offs. But that being said, how do you choose for a particular mission? Like, uh, is it just a a, a, a a manual decisions like you guys get together in a room and let's say that you 
assess for each approach what are the you know you you create your plot that that says like this one has a score of five for for uh, robustness and a score of three for uh, uh, efficiency of the communication and so on and so forth so in the end do you guys decide as uh, humans or is there some kind of uh, I don't want to say automated but at least guided or algorithmic approach to optimize these different factors because I don't know how would you consider like an extra point in efficiency versus or you know or or scaling going from uh, quadratic uh, communication um, costs from n log n how do you compare that with uh, some kind of robustness uh, whatever uh, that to me seems no. very overwhelming so how do you guys do it I this is a great 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 question how do we design the systems my take is it's a human decision so the charts I showed were decision A they were a way for us to put into words what we were discussing but the decision was human driven there are guidelines and you know that the first one that I think about is okay there is a thing called the cap theorem you would like your system to be consistent and available and resistant to partitions, which means everybody makes the same decisions. We get to decisions, and we also do that if um, communication networks go down. Well, the cap theorem tells us pick two. So I use that as my heuristic going in. I ask people, okay, you only get two. Which ones are you interested in? I am not, but I'm not aware of an algorithmic way of doing that, and I would not be comfortable with that mm -hmm. because it comes down to what are the requirements, what do the humans behind this want. Mm -hmm. In this scenario, partitions were a given. We don't know how Wi-Fi interacts with Regolith, so we should assume, we have to assume the worst. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't want this, the agents to act in too uncoordinated a way, but at the same time, we didn't want them to completely be completely stuck. So we picked a leader election approach, in which so long as we have a leader, we don't care about consistency. The leader rules, but we want the agents to have a consistent view of what the leader is. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I have a quick question. So thank you. I really enjoy seeing that all the theory in computer science over 40 years on coordination, you know, final, you know, has been found some novel applications. But there is a very famous area, which is the one of the Byzantine general problems. Probably you are aware. So I wonder whether you deal with this type of of settings, or you assume that the behavior is non-Byzantine? We assume, I'll give a very straight answer. We assume that the behavior is non-Byzantine. So we assume in the language of Nancy Lynch, we assume stopping failures. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we own these vehicles. We know their software. The added complexity of making them resilient to Byzantine by failures. So, you know, you have to build those trees and think about routing for different agents so that even if an agent is rewriting all the messages, um, all the complexity that comes from handling uh, Byzantine failures did not seem appropriate for the application that we are considering. I'm well aware of it. Uh, one area that I'm really excited okay. about exploring in the future is what if we have robots from different agencies collaborating? What if we have robots from different companies collaborating? But there, you know, in the spectrum from stopping failure to Byzantine failures, maybe going a little more by Byzantine could be a good idea because it gives you a very worst case approach, right? Um, but yeah, when mm -hmm. our robots break and- But in the future- you will have to de may have to deploy some of those systems in adversarial environments or malicious environments, which are then uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, oh, then may yeah, have a special the... physical ways to distort the behavior of the the robots. I I agree. It depends on the, the, what the threat model is, right? If the adversarial environment is somebody's jamming our communications, we're talking about link yeah. failures. So the coordinated attack mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the Byzantine generals problem, we're talking about nodes misbehaving. Um, if somebody no, gets into our nodes... People have shown get... that when you have uh, devices, for example, robots with sensors, Somebody can blind the robots with a lesser right. Acoustic signal can create a problem to gyroscopes. So, 
Yeah. Get them to drift. Okay. It's a really interesting area of research. Uh, I will be very upfront. We have not considered it for Cadre. We're going to be actually it's going to be the three of us, three robots from Cadre and one from John Hopkins ATL. We really hope the ATL robot is not a serial toward us. <laughs> um, really partly joking, but uh, it it becomes more and more relevant as you consider other applications. And going back to Phil's question. That's a case in which, like, does leader election make sense? Or does a more implicit coordination approach make more sense? Because that's a lot more robust. Mm -hmm. So that is where I would revisit, like, the fundamental assumptions of this approach and think of, you know, maybe something like JT House auctions or shared word, black word. Thank you, Federico. I have a really quick question. I would like to have a quick answer. You mentioned in your application that you're doing an interesting earth application using a similar framework, or at least that was my understanding, to exploration of the glacier uh, in the Antarctic. Uh, uh, can you say something brief on that? Or point yeah, brief? absolutely. So the project is called Ice Node. Why are we going to Antarctica? Because Antarctica is melting. Mm -hmm. uh, with global warming, it's melting from below. So you have these glaciers that jut out. From, so Antarctica is mostly, well, it, it's a rocky continent with ice on top. Uh, there are glaciers uh, that jut out from the rock. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have rock, water, ice. They're ice. melting from below. How quickly? We don't know because our radar doesn't measure the surface, but it's not able to measure below. So right now, how quickly do we know that they measure? Well, the British fly a plane out and then they land and they drill a hole and they measure thickness, really expensive. Uh, there is work on sending these buoyancy control probes. They drift in. Then once they get deep enough, how do they know deep enough? Well, localizing is hard, but you can get to gyros. They get on the bottom of the ice. They stay there for six months, measure melting rate by looking at how salty the water is. The le le less salty means it's melting faster. Then they come down, they drift out. Uh, if you do that open loop, you get back maybe one in three, one in four probes. If you do closed loop control of these probes with some, you know, some knowledge of what the flows are, we show that you can get back maybe 70, 75% of the probes. And more importantly, you can target them. You can get them to land under ice where you care about it the most. Oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Leonardo. Let me uh, so this conclude uh, our symposium. We are getting the conclusion. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, all my, the panel, finalists. We uh, really enjoy your pre presentations. And um, I would like to express my gratitude to the Gerla family for their generosity in sponsoring this award. And it is my pleasure now to introduce Professor Maggie Phillips Gerla, that is Mario Gerla, wife, who has been a strong Eisner supporter over the years. Please, Maggie. Um, be here. This is my daughter, Christina. Um, you will get to meet my our, uh, other daughter in, in Washington, D.C. in November. But we're really delighted that we um, uh, have you three incredibly, you know, avant-garde scholars as a finalist for this award. I know that Mario would be so delighted. I mean, he would be, well, you see his picture in the back. He, he would be leaning forward with like a million questions to ask you and want to follow up with each of you individually and, uh, and follow your research. I think you probably might recognize that he's, uh, uh, his his work is sort of embedded at the base of, of many of your uh, uh, projects. Um, he's Leonardo, you know, of course, that he was next generation uh, uh, mobile network and network performance. That was his dissertation topic, network performance on the ARPANET. Um, um, Mario, he was such an incredibly strong promoter. As department chair, he helped to initiate a lot of the AI and machine learning activities that are going on at UCLA. And Federico, he, Mario had not gone interplanetary yet, but he was definitely at the basis foundational work in, in autonomous networks. 
um, autonomous uh, vehicle networks and sensor networks. And he would be thrilled to see that you're doing this and particularly delighted um, about your work in Antarctica because he went to Antarctica in, uh, uh, just uh, uh, in, in some of his last years. Um, I know that he would applaud your pursuing research too, that ask the interesting questions uh, about that you're passionate about that promotes interdisciplinary and interorganizational interaction and expands your collegial network and also that has practical applications with important social impact. Uh, uh, and, and so I encourage you to continue in these purpose, with these purposes as your guiding stars. Um, I'm really looking forward to meeting you all in person and continuing the conversation in DC in November. And I, um, so I want to congratulate you again. And I, I definitely want to thank our outstanding jur jury, uh, Leila, Elisa, uh, Phil. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and energy to, to do this important work. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Maggie, for these aspiring words. And we all look forward to seeing, to meeting you in uh, myself, to meet you for the third time in Washington, D.C., where actually we are preparing with good weather already right now. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Last but not least, let me introduce uh, the president of ISNA, Dr. G uh, Dr. Cinzia Zufada, who will uh, say a few words and conclude the symposium. Please, Cinzia. Thank you, Leila. Many thanks to uh, the candidates here for the outstanding work, uh, the jury for all the work that you have done so far. There is some, to, some more to go, right? You will have the difficult task uh, of choosing the winner. And uh, uh, again, to uh, the Gerla family, it's always a pleasure to see uh, uh, Maggie, Professor Phil Philip Gerla, uh, uh, with her enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of the family. I look forward to seeing you again in DC, uh, to seeing you all in DC and continuing this uh, conversation. It has been an exciting uh, symposium. And it's coming to an end uh, with a sense of uh, good work on everybody. And uh, thank you for being part uh, of uh, the ISNAF work. The symposium has reached its conclusion. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for the great organization. Thank you.